turn with me this morning to Isaiah 59, the Old Testament book of Isaiah. I'd like to express my thanks uh, to the church family for your, your prayers, uh, your texts, your emails, uh, your visits. Uh, I felt the, the power of God working in the body of Christ at Pleasant Hill. It's thankful for men to come by, lay their hands on me, and pray over me. It's something as a pastor you don't, uh, you're normally the one doing that. It's a blessing when you have others pray for you and minister to you and your family. And I'm very humbled and grateful for that. And by the way, if I said anything out of the way last Sunday to you, I don't remember it. Uh, And I was also told since I'm on medication now, I can just say whatever I want to say and blame it on medication too. So there's no telling what's going to take place this morning. Isaiah 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He does not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wickedness. No one enters suit justly, no one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas, they speak lies, they conceive mischief mischief and give birth to iniquity. They hatch adder's eggs, they weave the spider's web. He who eats their eggs dies, and from the one that is crushed a viper is hatched. Their webs will not serve as clothing. Men will not cover themselves with what they make. Their works are works of iniquity, and deeds of violence are in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their highways. The way of peace they do not know, and there is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked, No one who treads on them knows peace. Therefore justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, and behold darkness, and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight among those in full vigor. We are like dead men. Verse 11. We all growl like bears. We moan and moan like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities. Transgressing and denying the Lord, and turning back from following our God, Speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart lying words, justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. Verse 17, He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. To the coastlands he will render repayment. Verse 19. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. 
And a Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turns from transgression, declares the Lord. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of, or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. May the Lord add the blessings to His Word. On April the 18th, 1912, there was a ship that left and departed from Southampton, England, on its way to New York City, New York. And on the night, around 11.40 p.m., the ship struck an iceberg on its way four days later, April the 14th. And within two hours, that ship sank to the bottom of the ocean. And upon that ship that left Southampton, England, were some of the most wealthiest people in the entire world. And also upon that ship was also some of the poorest people in the world, peasants and, and slaves as it, as it were that it boarded that ship. And as the ship struck that iceberg in the middle, middle of the Atlantic Ocean and it began to take on water upon itself, and the captain and the, and the crew knew what was taking place, the, the ship began to slowly sink. But the, the wealthy people, they were inside the ballroom and they were doing all the things that they enjoyed doing and enjoying the festivals and the, and the dance and the, and the music and the things of what wealthy people enjoyed. And all the while there was turmoil that was setting forth before them. The ship was sinking. They were dying and did not even know it yet. Within two hours, the ship sank. On the ship, there was over 1,500 people. As many of you know, the ship was named Titanic. But there was a problem. Out of over 1,500 people on the Titanic, there was only enough lifeboats for 1,100 people. That meant all the women and children was to go first. And all the while, the rich and the wealthy was inside, enjoying themselves. Dying and not even knowing it. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about dying and not even knowing it? Can you imagine the surprise of the people on the Titanic as the ship began to go down and then it finally hit them that this is serious business? Well, just like it was with the Titanic, so it was with Israel. And so as it is with us today. But for us as Christians today, we have some sort of realization that we are truly dying. We don't sit around and think, well, there's another minute gone by, I'm dying slowly. But in reality, in the back of our mind, as believers, we know that death is coming. And we know that it is something that we are going to face. But what takes place in our lives so often times is that we want to block it out of our minds and act as though it isn't happening or it won't ever take place. When we come to our Scriptures, we see that these people, these Israel, God's chosen nation, had been carried off to Babylonian captivity. And this is post-exilic. They have come back to Jerusalem. The walls are destroyed. The, the, the temple has been destroyed. And they come and they're wondering why God is so far away from them. In Isaiah 58 verse 3, He tells them, they ask a question to God. God, we fast. We do all these things. We go, to the, we go to try to worship You. We read the Scriptures. And yet it's like in verse 1 of Isaiah 59, You don't hear us. You're far away from us. Death was slowly encrypting them as it is us today. And what I want us to see is with Israel, what drove them away from their God was one thing and one thing only. It was their sin. 
It was them themselves that was driving themselves away from God. If you get anything out of the message this morning, please take this with you. Sin keeps God from us. Sin keeps God from us. It's not the sin of a rapist. It's not the sin of the homosexual. It's not the sin of the murderer. It's the sin of gossip. It's the sin of of busybodiness. It's the sin of commission and the sins of omissions. It's the sins that keep God from us that disables us to experience the full presence of God. And I believe where you live in a society today and even the church is even desensitized to who God is. Because we have this mentality that God is a God like our grandpa. And it's just not true. God is so much bigger than you and I. He tells us in Isaiah that His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. He says, and when you thought that, you, that I was just like you. What is it that causes the church today to experience or not experience the fullness of God? It is our sin. It is our sin. And I'm speaking directly to myself. What is it that causes me not to experience the fullness of God? My sin. Why is the church in the condition that she's in today? It's our sin. Leonard Ravenhill, one of the greatest evangelists of the 1900s, when asked, why does revival tarry? He said this, there are two great reasons we don't have revival. And this guy died in 1994. I believe he was a prophet in his own way. He says, this is the reason why the church doesn't have revival today. He says, because we're content to live without it. What do you say about that? We're content to live without revival. We're content not to know the fullness of God, in a sense. In our actions, in our deeds. But he also goes on to say, not only are we content to live without revival, he says another reason why we don't experience the fullness of God in revival is because it's too costly. You see, revival costs something. Knowing the fullness of God is going to cost us something. It's going to cost us to die to ourselves and take up our cross and follow after Him on a daily basis. Jesus didn't say when you felt like it, but He says every day you're going to have to carry your cross. That cross, as I remind my children, is not some kind of little pretty jewelry thing that we wear around our neck, but no, in the day of Christ, it was as equivalent to the electric chair today. It was a tool for crucifixion. It was a tool of... Uh, of execution. It was a place of blood and torture and wrath, as it were. Brothers and sisters, revival cost God everything, in a sense, in our salvation. And yet, we as a church today, in America today, will say we want revival, but as long as it doesn't cost us anything. Ravenhill continues on and he says, we, just, we don't want God to interrupt our status quo. I've been asking for a month now as your pastor to be praying for these meetings and be praying for how God would, would work in your life and sin that in our own lives, our own personal lives. And I know you're not sitting there saying, well, Brother Chad, I have no sin. I, I know you're not saying that. And I've been asking you, be praying, be seeking the Lord, because this is what we're, we're wanting God to meet with us this week. Matter of fact, we want God to meet with us today. We, we want the Spirit of God to work in our lives and not to play churchianity and be religious, because that's exactly what the Pharisees were. And Jesus says they are brood of vipers. But it was also with Israel here. They had forsaken the God that, they, that had chosen them. 
the God who redeemed them out of Egypt, the very God who rained down manna from heaven for 40 days and 40 nights, the very God who, who, who led them to be the nation that they were. And, and the, all the while, you see the golden calves, you see the rejection, you see the rebellion, you see the sin of Israel. And God repeatedly told them, if you forsake me, this is what's going to happen. If you do not turn, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And lo and behold, it happened. They was, God raised up Persia. God raised up Assyria. And they came in and took the very people of God away in captivity for over 70 years. And now they have come back to Jerusalem. And it's like, what is going on here? And they pour their hearts out before God. And yet they're still infatuated with what they grew with the, what they knew in Assyria and Babylon. And so when we come to our verses in Isaiah 59, the first thing I want us to do is I want you to see six characterizations of people who do not desire the presence of God. What we're going to see in these verses is just the, the characteristics of people who do not desire God. Now remember, these are the people of God. And this is Isaiah speaking to them, as the, as the Lord's speaking to them. Notice first of all in verse 2 what Isaiah says. He calls them ungodly. He says here, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. It is your iniquities. Notice in verse 1, notice they ask a question and, and he's responding, is the Lord's arm too short that he can't save us? Has God forsaken us? Has God, is he not able to hear us? What the people of God is doing is charging God with their sin. They're blaming God for the result of where they're at. And he tells them in verse 2, your iniquities. It is your sins that have made a separation between you and your God. Have you ever just felt like God's a million miles away from you? Have you ever prayed and it's just like the ceiling's right here and your prayers hit and they just come right back down? Have you ever just, you, you, like God is so far away from us. Did God ever move? Did God move? We are reminded that the separation comes from our sin. And notice it is our sins, he says in the last part of verse 2, that has hidden His face from us, or from you, as He is speaking here to them. It's the ungodliness of these people of Israel. They had fallen into false idolatry, pagan worship. They had been succumbed to the world that was around them. And here, they are separated from God, alienated at enmity toward God. The very God who saved them. Do you see yourself in this anywhere? Do I see myself here? And then he goes on to tell us in verses 3 through 5 that the, another characteristic of people who did not desire the presence of God it was their wickedness. Notice what he says in verse 3 For your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wickedness. In verse 5, it says, They hatch adders' eggs, they weave the spider's web. He who eats their eggs dies, and from one that is crushed, a viper is hatched. This wickedness, in other words, th these are the very people of God who are drawn to evil. You say, well, that can't be so. Do you remember the story of Moses in Exodus chapter 32? Moses is up on Mount Sinai with God. He leaves Aaron at the bottom to oversee the people of God. And what does the people of God want to do? They want a God that they can worship, that they can fashion with their own hands, that they can make with their own, uh, see with their own eyes and coddle it and touch it, feel it. And this was pure wickedness. And they were drawn to it rather than to the righteousness. 
They sought after things that brought great displeasure to God. Paul uses this same language here. In, in verse 5, it speaks about the, the spider. It spins his web and you get caught in it. I, I was trying to find an illustration with my spider bite this week and I just could never work it in there. But, but how a spider web, it, 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 it entangles you. And it's deadly. And it can be deadly. And it tells us here that it is deadly. He who eats their eggs dies, and from the one that is crushed, viper is hatched. These people being drawn into wickedness, but it's not that they're drawn into wickedness. They want others to join in their ungodliness and in their wickedness. It's just not enough that they're in it, but they want other people to join along in their vileness and their wickedness and their unrighteousness and their ungodliness. In other words, sin just comes natural to them, as it were. It doesn't much bother them that they do these things and live this way. We see this as a characteristic of people who do not desire the presence of God. Verses 6 through 8, he goes on to speak, particularly verse 7, verse 8, that their feet run to evil. They are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their highways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their past. They have made the roads crooked. No one treads on them knows peace. The crookedness of their hearts. Their heart is not bent into the narrow path, but yet the, the, the curvy and the crooked path. You lay the plumb line beside their life and it just doesn't match up. The plumb line of, of Scripture. Their desire is that of ungodliness and of wickedness and crookedness. And in other words, in this crookedness, they want their way and when they don't get their way, They'll, they'll get it one way or the other by their uh, conniving or scheming. Isaiah also speaks and calls them here in verse 9 and 10. He refers to them in darkness. But I want you to notice something here that Isaiah changes the pronoun from you to us now in verse 9. He says in verse 9, Therefore justice is far from us. And righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light and behold darkness. For brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight. Among those in full vigor, we are like dead men. Those who do not desire the presence of God lives in darkness, as Jesus spoke about in John. That they would rather be in the darkness than exposed by the light. Let me just stop for a second and, and maybe put some application to us before you, you fall asleep. What is it that consumes you on a daily basis? Match your life up to Scripture this morning. Let me match my life up to Scripture this morning. What characterizes me as a person who calls himself a Christian? Is that of ungodliness? Is it a life that is separated from God except for 11 o'clock on Sunday? Is the only time I talk about Christ on Sunday morning when we meet? Is the only time I study the Scripture on Sunday morning? The only time I seek God in prayer on Sunday when somebody else prays? The only time I share the Gospel is when I'm... Uh, uh, well, never. And we wonder why our churches are so weak. We think, what is wrong with America today? What is wrong with the families today? What is wrong with the church today? Hold on with me because there's some good news, okay? He goes on to say in verse 11 that there's hopelessness as well. He says, we all growl like bears. We moan and moan like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. These people here are hopeless. They have come to their wit's end, if you will. They've been carried off to Babylon captivity. They've come back. And it's like the world around them has been crushed. It has been removed around them. There is no hope. As a matter of fact, right now they're not even seeking that hope. 
They have been so inundated by the world. They have become more conformed as the world rather than the nation that God had chose them to be. A holy and pure nation. Which, i.e., fast forward 2,000 years, speaking of the church today. You think of the church today, it's hard to separate the church from the world. As one preacher said, our churches today look like six flags over Jesus. You can't, in other words, people won't tolerate the Scriptures being preached or the Gospel being proclaimed. You don't want to say the Word of Christ out in the world. There's a sense of hopelessness as you look in the world, as you, as Brother Garrett prayed for the airliner that went down and over 200 people died, perished. We look in the world and we think, what in the world is going on? It is hopeless. No, it's not. It's not hopeless. In verse 12 and 13, he goes on to say, but their transgressions are multiplied. Before you, our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities. Transgressing and denying the Lord and turning back from following our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart lying words. In other words, these people were just inundated in their perverseness. They did not want the presence of God as it were. Because of the perverseness, their transgressions and their sins just multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. What a seemingly hopeless, impossible situation here. I don't know about you, but I, I'm somewhat like Israel here. I battle with these things, these six things every day of my own life. Do you see yourself as a miniature Israel here? Do you struggle with ungodliness and wickedness and, and, and uh, what other things? Crookedness and darkness and hopelessness and perverseness? Are you drawn to those things when there's an accident on the side of the road and you see helicopters and ambulance and police officers? Do you just mind your own business or do you slow down real slow to kind of see what's going on? We're drawn to those things. We're drawn to those things that may be ungodly to watch on television or to say those things which does not bring glory to God. We all struggle with these. We look at the church today and we say that it's hopeless. I would say it's not hopeless. I believe it's when the church is at the point of hopelessness that there's hope. The problem with the church today is that we've not found our end yet. We think... We have it all figured out. It's just like salvation, brothers and sisters. Somebody doesn't beat their chest. God, here I am. You got lucky when you got me. That's not how God works in salvation. A person has to come to the end of themselves. They have to come to see that there is nothing good in and of themselves. They're just like Israel as it were. There's nothing to boast in except what God has provided for that individual in Christ. And so it is for the church today and so it is for our families in, the, in America that we live in today. I'm thankful that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And I want you to see that Isaiah doesn't leave his people without hope and neither shall I. God gave His people a promise and a hope. As they were to look by faith unto God, as they were to not only look to faith, to, by faith to God, but they were to confess these sins. They were to repent of their sins. They were to turn and that God would hear them. And that's exactly what we find in verse 12. We see that he, they repent they speak of their sin. Notice, they, they say our transgressions. They're admitting their multitude of sin. Their transgressions are multiplied before you. Our sins testify against us. 
For our transgressions are with us and we know our iniquities. Brothers and sisters, that must be the prayer of Pleasant Hill Baptist Church for God to send revival. If we are haughty before God and we think that a man by the name of David Miller will come in and bring revival, we are fooling ourselves. Revival begins with each one of us personally. Why does revival tarry? I just give you six reasons. Six characteristics shown from Israel and from the Scriptures. But it takes individuals that makes up the church. It begins with you and I personally seeking and confessing our sins before God. And so as we finish, I want to give you from Scripture five agencies of revival that we see the Lord's hand and the promise of God here to Israel. What God is going to do, He's going to bring restoration. He's going to redeem His people. He's not going to leave them hopeless. Isn't that good? Aren't you glad that even when you are faithless, He remains faithful? Aren't you glad when you, are, or when you are at the rock bottom of yourself that God is still on His throne ruling and reigning and we by faith can look to Him? Do you believe this morning that the Lord's hand is too short that He can, can save? Or His ears too dull that He can't hear? I believe God hears His children. But not with sin in their life. When there is unconfessed and unrepented sin in your life, God, He tells us, He has, doesn't hear our sin, our prayers. So there's five agencies I want us to look at. In verse 1, we see the Lord's hand. The Lord's hand. Notice the question here, or, or the statement, and it stems from the question from Isaiah 58, verse 3. The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. What is revival? Revival is a supernatural outpouring work of the Spirit of God whereby the preaching of God's divine judgment, confession of sin and repentance, and the receiving of salvation is brought about by the Spirit of God. We cannot coerce God to bring revival. Revival is not something we can whip up. Revival is only something that God can send. It has to be His hand reaching down. It has to be His arm bringing us revival. The question is, as Dr. Ravenhill would say, do we want revival? Because are we content to live without it? Because it's going to cost us something. What is impossible for God? Is there anything impossible for God? I would say no. But what happens is when revival comes, it's messy. It's ugly. It's not the stereotype church. Thing that takes place because people begins confessing their sin. People begins confessing of their adulterous affair and their fornications and their drunkenness and all the things that, that's taking place in their lives. They begin confessing these things because the Spirit of God is working in their lives and bearing down upon them. And, and not just that, confessing gossip or, or whatever it would be. It's the Lord's hand that brings revival. I, I'm not naive to, enough to think that we will cause revival to take place here. This revival comes from the Lord's hand and it's a sovereign work of God. But notice not only that, God also uses His ear. The last part of verse 1. Is God's ear so dull that He cannot hear? Does God not hear us? Can He not reach down? Can He not hear us? Yes! It's a rhetorical question. We know the answer. God is able to reach down. He's able to send revival. He's able to hear our prayers. The question is, church, do we want it? Do we want to experience the presence of God? 
And I'm not just talking about the meetings next week. I'm talking about for months and years to last here at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. That it would affect our communities. It would affect the taverns and the pubs and the, and the brothels and all those. That it would affect people's lives to the glory of God. Do we desire that? The Lord hears the cries of distress and the repentance of His people, brothers and sisters. Notice verse 21. We see the Lord's Spirit. Another agency of revival is the Lord's Spirit. His hand, His ear, His Spirit. Verse 21, He says, My Spirit that is upon you and My words that I put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your covenant, uh, children's Offering, But notice in verse 21 right there, he says here that he's made a covenant with them. The Lord's Spirit though, the promise of God to dwell with His people. Now, the Spirit of God in the Old Testament came upon His people and left. Came and left. But guess what? We're not in the Old Testament anymore, are we? Ephesians 1.13 says that we have been sealed until the day of redemption. We are sealed tightly in Christ. And the Spirit of God to every child of His who have repented and placed faith in Christ, we are sealed. We are to dwell with Him eternally. And however, the Spirit of God, brothers and sisters, convicts us. It convicts us of our apathy. It convicts us of our sin. It convicts us of our shortcoming. It convicts us when we say things that we shouldn't say or when we go to places that we shouldn't go or we do things that we shouldn't do. The Spirit of God convicts us and brings us to a place of repentance. The question is, church, are we convicted? Does the Spirit convict us? Does it move us to a place of repentance? Or are we satisfied with the status quo? The Lord's Spirit. He renews and revives those who are truly His. You know, it's utterly amazing how people will say that they're Christians. You know, everybody in the South is Christians, right? Everybody's saved, especially in this community. Everybody's all right. They're saved on their way to heaven. And yet, as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, their life doesn't reflect that. There are church members who will die and bust hell wide open because they have a false assurance of their salvation. They said a prayer, they joined the church, they was baptized, and yet there is no fruit of repentance. As the old preachers used to say, not only do you repent one time, but you continually are a repenter. It's not that I did that like a flu shot, but it's a life, lifestyle of repenting over our sin. And the church has largely come complacent to just say, we're okay, we're saved. No repentance, no brokenness. And I often wonder if the Spirit of God, as in the churches of Revelation, has removed His lampstand. Did you know churches can meet together and sing and, and read the Scriptures and do everything that we've done today and the Spirit of God not dwell in the midst of them? How sad would that be? The Lord uses His Spirit, but also verse 21, He says that the Lord uses His Word to bring about revival. The Spirit doesn't work alone. A lot of times everybody puts so much emphasis. Spirit, 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 Spirit. Holy Spirit, Holy I believe in the Holy Spirit. Yes, I do. But it works in accordance with the Word. The Word of God as well. You, you can have a bunch of Spirit stuff going on or saying that and the Word not ever be preached or never be opened. God's not going to bless that. It is always accompanied, the Spirit always is accompanied by the Word of God. This time through the prophet Isaiah, in latter times, Hebrews says that He has spoken through Christ. And now to us through the revealed Word of God here today. How will God bring about revival? He will do it by His sovereign hand by listening to the cries of confession and repentance of His children, by His Spirit, through the proclamation of His Word. 
Listen, this is all we have, folks. It's either this or sink. That's it. And I guarantee you that that's come this week, that word will be proclaimed. And Well, not only this week, but for the last five years as your pastor, I have been faithful, tried by the best, tried my best, not the best, to be faithful to preach this book and that God would honor it and God would glorify Himself in that. Honestly, I believe God's blessed it. <laughs> it's not because of me. It's because of God and His Word and His promises that He uses His Spirit and His Word to bring about revival. And the last thing I want us to really hone in on here is that the Lord, the last agency He uses is Himself. He uses Christ. He uses Himself to bring about revival. If Christ is not preached, it's useless. We have no Savior other than Christ. If anything else is preached than Christ, Paul says it's a false gospel. And so the Word has to be open and we have to be pointed to Christ. And what we find here in our text is that Isaiah is further pointing to Christ in verse 16. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head, which we hear of Paul speak about in Ephesians 6 here in the next few weeks. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Notice this, according to their deeds, so will he repay. This isn't a baby in a manger anymore. He is going to repay wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. He will render repayment. And guess what? Verse 19 says, They shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and His glory from the rising of the sun. For He will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. And a Redeemer will come to Zion. To those in Jacob who turn from transgression declares the Lord. Where is the hope for Israel? It is in this coming Redeemer. This Messiah, the one who is going to make all the wrongs right. The one who is going to make every knee bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God to the glory of God. It is He who is going to come and repay. Revengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's the Lord Himself. And brothers and sisters, this is not the swaddling baby in the manger, but this is the one coming on the white horse that John revealed in the book of Revelation. And He's coming to, 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 to judge in wrath and fury. This is the message. And God says He will repay. This is amazing because God raised up Persia and Assyria to conflict and to carry off Israel to Babylon captivity. And now he says, I raised them up. Now I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to repay them. But however, there is one coming, brothers and sisters, today. He has come and He's returning soon and very soon. I believe the judgment of God is upon us. Whether you know it or not, God is judging America. I believe it more and more day by day. It is almost like the beef farmer who buys a little calf. Buys it. You used to buy them kind of cheap. Now they're not cheap anymore. And that farmer buys that calf for one purpose. He's going to feed it. He's going to take care of it. He's going to fatten it up. And he's going to carry it to the sale. Somebody's going to buy that piece of meat. And they got one purpose in that. Buying it. They're going to slaughter it. They're going to kill it. 
I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet. As I look at our situation, it is almost like God is fattening us up for the slaughter. Oh, you want more? Yeah, here's more. Oh, you want this? Yeah, here. Go ahead. You have that. Oh, you want more of that? Yeah, go ahead. You despise me? You don't revere me? You kill millions of babies a year? You take my name and you use it in vain? Here, more, more. You want more and more and more and more. And we wonder why we don't experience the fullness of God as God's people. I'm not even talking about the lost world. I'm talking about us. How it's affected us. Do you see how it's affected us? I know how it's affected me. The luxuries we have been given, I believe, has become to our own ruin. We are so inundated. I know my, I'm talking about myself. What's the first thing you think about when you get up in the morning? And what's the last thing you think about before you go to bed? Is the first thing you do in the morning is turn on the TV and see what's going over on in the Middle East? Or is it to seek our God in the Scriptures? Do we seek Him in prayer? Or are we too busy on our iPhones and the internet? If God is going to send revival, it will be centered upon the redemptive work of Christ. It will be brought because of repentance of His people. It will be the confession of our sin. I just want to encourage us as believers here today, there is hope still. And it starts with us individually. Listen, I don't know your life. I don't know what you think about first thing in the morning last thing you go to bed. But let me urge all of us, let it be about God and the goodness of Christ and that He's ruling and He's reigning. Let's pray and to seek God this week that He would send revival, that He would begin with us. May God give us boldness to invite our neighbor to come hear the Gospel or share the Gospel with them themselves. Listen, brothers and sisters, there's people on the Titanic today and it's going down. And they're all around us. The only question is, are... We're going to turn our faces and let them perish? Or are we going to speak up? But it begins with us. I close with this. In March of 23rd, 1775, there was a man who made this quote. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Does anybody know who said that? Patrick Henry. Do they teach that in school anymore? May we say at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, may our lives not be so dear, and may we not want peace so sweet. Forbid it, Almighty God. Give us revival in our souls and in our church or in our nation. Or just give us death. What if we prayed like that? Some of you here today need to turn from your sin and turn to Christ. You've broken God's holy law and because God is holy and perfect and righteous, He must judge your sin and He will judge your sin. And unless if you turn and place faith in Christ, you will suffer the eternal wrath of God underneath His judgment for your sin. However, the good news is that Jesus has suffered the wrath. That's the reason why we can sing hallelujah, what a Savior. 
He bore the wrath and He took the fury of His Father for those who would believe. Some of you need to repent today for salvation and others of us. So it's either or. We need to repent for our apathy toward God. We need to repent for our lack of desire of communion with God. Our lack of prayerfulness. Our lack of, of, of our desire and of, of concern for others. I would say we're like Laodicea. We need to pray, I know myself, for repentance of being lukewarm. God said, I'd rather have you hot or cold. This lukewarmness, I'll spew you out. We need to repent of the lack of concern for God's glory in our daily lives. Some of you may need to repent because of your, your ideal or your mindset you've already had toward this coming week. Some of the things that you've already said about prayer meetings. Things that you've already maybe thought in your mind, well, I might go Saturday or Sunday. Or I might do this or do that. I don't know But I do know this, that God will bless and hear His people who confess their sins before Him. And so this week, as we go into homes and as we meet together to pray, I want to encourage you to do that. James says if you have sin, confess it to one another. Maybe today you need to confess sin here. Maybe your sin is open before people and you know that people know about your sin that you need to confess before the Lord. Listen, God's arm is not too short that He's not able to save and His ear is not too dull that He cannot hear. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're grateful for Your mercy and Your love and Your grace. Lord, thank thank You that You grant repentance. Father, thank You that You convict by Your Spirit of our sin and our failures and our shortcoming. But I'm thankful that You sent Christ to the cross to atone for our sins. Thank You that we can look to Christ by faith, trusting in the shed blood, knowing that we have been redeemed. Lord, that each one of us here today need to confess before You. And Lord, it's a daily lifestyle. It's a daily struggle. But Father, for You to glorify Yourself, Father, would it please You, Lord, by Your Spirit working in your people's lives. Lord, would you please grant revival, grant us a renewal of spiritual refreshness here at Pleasant Hill. Lord, I'm sick of my apathy. I'm tired of my religiosity. God, give me a desire for you like none other. Lord, may it be a prayer of Your people here. For these children and for adults here today without Christ, Lord, I pray that You would draw them. That You would grant them forgiveness and repentance. And they would look unto Christ and be saved. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.